What's up, it's Matt. A special episode of MPTV. We're at the National Buffalo Wing Festival in Buffalo, New York, where it all started. And we're with a guy that started someplace that we all know about. Scott, tell us about this Buffalo Wing place you started many years ago. Well, thanks. Um, it was a lo long, long time ago. My brother and I uh, got together one weekend in Kent, Ohio. Um, and we'd been out for most of the evening and we came out and we were looking for some food. And uh, we came across this gyro stand that was out in the street, a cart. Okay. And the guy was shaving the meat outside and there were some flies buzzing around. <laughs> and my brother said, you want one of these? I went, it's not too attractive looking right now. And he goes, well, you know, he goes, they're up and down the street at Ohio State, they're everywhere. And I went, well, that's fine, they can be everywhere, you know, but it's just not too attractive. He said, well, they're like chicken wings, they're everywhere. And I went, oh, time out. Chicken wings are not everywhere. You, you're from Pittsburgh, and they have wingdings there. We both lived in Buffalo, where they had chicken wings. But I'm in Ohio, and I have not seen chicken wings around here for a long time. Oh, and he said, well, I'm sure there's some wings around here. I said, OK, I'll bet you $5. We always had these brotherly bets yeah. between us. And he said, well, let's go find chicken wings. And we gave a time limit till 2 AM that he could find chicken wings. And so I was unfortunately betting that he couldn't find them. He was betting that he could find them. We weren't around all for about two hours. I, finally won the bet, uh, and it was pretty late, so we never did eat that day. That's kind of part of the story is that we <laughs> were hungry guys and never got to eat. So we went back to the motel, went to bed. He had to get up early in the next morning at 6 a.m., so we only had like three hours of sleep. So we're having a, finally a meal at Waffle House, and he goes, that's a great idea we had last night about opening a chicken wing restaurant. And I said, well, I'll tell you the truth. The way my grades are, we ought to pursue this. <laughs> so, and that's kind of how the idea started. And then it really took us almost two years before we actually finally got a, a location open. Um, I went back to school uh, my senior year. We are going to try to get it open in 1981, but it didn't happen in 1981. Um, the location we were looking at didn't want to allow us to have beer. We felt it was very important to have beer at the location. So we, we, we decided to scrap the whole idea. I kind of really wanted to finish my senior year. So during that time, I actually did some projects at school, okay. re researching, opening a restaurant and doing it. Jim had done research prior to that that I used in Jim's my your project. Brother? Yeah, Jim okay. Disbro is my brother. And so I graduated in May and said, we've got to get back on this idea because I really needed a job still, especially at this point. <laughs> and we spent the summer of 1982 looking for an extra partner. And because we had four partners the year before, but one guy had dropped out. So we'd gone from four back to three. We needed to find another partner. We went around all sorts of friends, family, whoever asking. Nobody wanted to join us. Um, we were actually up here in Buffalo, New York. Uh, we had approached some bankers up here and stuff. They had all turned us down. Again, some other uh, far family friends and stuff we approached up here all turned us down. We were returning back to Columbus where I was staying with my brother at the time. And we were kind of depressed thinking we would reach the 11th hour. It wasn't going to happen. And he goes, well, I got this one guy out in Oklahoma that I used to teach skating with and he's from Britain and he always wanted to open up an English pub so if we tell him we're gonna open up an English pub serving chicken wings maybe we can get him interested so we called this guy Bernard Spencer who's a dance champion from uh, Great Britain and said hey you wanna have a, a, a pub serving chicken wings he said well send me a proposal well the only thing we had at the time was actually a copy of the report I'd done in college and my brother took it and cut it up. Uh, and for Donia, New York, we, I remember getting off the road. We went in, found a place to, well, uh, cut it up and put it together. Yeah. I wanted to make some copies because I didn't have a copy of my report. Uh, there was no computers at the time. I didn't have a second copy of it because you had to type it. So I only had one copy. He cuts it up. I asked if we could copy it. He goes, you got any money? I didn't even have a quarter to get five nickels to, to copy it for <laughs> five cents a copy. And he, we sent off the, 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 what we had page-wise on Friday and went home. Friday night, we're twiddling our thumbs, knowing, you know, is anything going to happen? So they finally got it Saturday morning. And Saturday afternoon, they called us and said they were in. Wow. And so uh, we had our fourth partner. Then we had to actually go about the business of, of moving forward with what we'd already uh, set up. Yep. Now, part of the interesting story is, in 1981, somebody from Buffalo had actually gone down to Columbus, Ohio and opened up a chicken wing restaurant. And so we would actually, if we had opened in 81, they would open in 81. We would add two competing chicken wing restaurants at Ohio State's campus and nobody even had heard of chicken wings chicken at wing, the time. Yeah. Fortunately for us and unfortunately for them, it didn't do so well for them. Um, and they actually closed up in January of 1982. 
So actually in the spring of 82, while we were looking for opportunities, we found that location that had just been chicken wings. It just closed. <laughs> and that's actually the location we went into because we were so undercapitalized, we were able to go into their failed restaurant that had the fryers, the hood, there. and all, well, almost everything there. And, and we had such a limited budget, we could have never really gotten off the ground. I don't even know how we were thinking we'd get off the ground because we only had roughly $35,000 between well, between all of us. Yeah. I put in five, Jim put in five, um, when the other partner who was originally with us put in five, and that poor last guy, Bernard, uh, we told him his deal was to put in five plus a $15,000 loan. So that was his commitment. And so that's how we got 35 grand. But by the time we bought a sign and, and bought a microwave and a couple other things, we had spent a fair amount of money and we wanted to have a little bit of operating capital left um, because we weren't sure what was gonna happen. And so, a very tight budget. We were able to go into a failed location, open up, and do chicken wings. When I'm, every, I'm still amazed that we actually went into a failed location and, and did, did what had just failed. It, may, it makes no sense in the world, but it just but it, it worked. It, it, yeah, it happened. I, I, I what was I don't the know, original name of my place? Yeah. Or, oh, originally we called it Buffalo Wild Wings and Weck. Okay. And it was a, a, an acronym to BW3. And Jim, who was a little bit older than me, uh, had seen a show on TV in the 60s called That Was The Week That Was, and it was called TW3. So he wanted to kind of play off of that acronym, okay. and we made BW3, which I thought was really great, and I, oh, yeah. and I still think it's a great name because it's very different than everybody else out there. Um, but then years later, they dropped the, the word the WEC, WEC yep. and just went to Buffalo Wild Wings. I think they were thinking about sizing of lettering on a, a marquee or something like that. Well, that's why I was curious that when, when it went from when it went to BW3, yeah. if that was originally, because everybody knows it as BW3. Yeah, no, that was originally. Uh, B-dubs, yeah. BW3, yeah. Buffalo Wild, yeah. But yeah. The, the WEC got dropped off uh, pretty quick. No, no, it oh, wasn't was it? until probably late 90s, oh, okay. maybe in two, oh, no, it, it, it was on there for a long okay. time, yeah. yeah. How many, how many locations, when did you go from one location to, you know, five to 10 to 15, at what, at what well, point did Well, we actually, um, we, we were pretty aggressive. My brother was very aggressive, let me say it that way. We opened the first location, we did moderate in the beginning, then we started doing well, then he felt at that point, we were only like six months that we needed to get a second location. Six months <laughs> in. So the spring- He is aggressive. The, yeah, the spring of 1983, uh, he started you know pushing that we found another location to add to it and try to grow the chain. and. We made a lot of mistakes. I'll be the first to say we made a lot of mistakes we learned from them. And unfortunately, our second location, again, we went with the attractiveness of a restaurant that had failed and had all the equipment in it, so it was gonna be an easy turnkey situation, but it wasn't because the one thing we hadn't paid a whole lot of attention to, which we did, I mean, we did, but we didn't, we should have paid a little more attention to, was that the second location was in the town of Westerville, Ohio. Yeah, no Westerville. It's also the home of the temperance movement. It okay. was home of Prohibition. It's where Prohibition started was oh, Westerville, yeah. Ohio. And when we opened up, you want to know what? It was still under Prohibition. And we could not have a liquor license in Westerville, Ohio. So there we had wings, but no beer, no beer. and not a chance we could have beer. We did moderately okay for about a year there. Um, and then it, it wasn't doing the best. And then along came a really bad snowstorm, I think in 19, 1984 and it really put a hurt on us. And so then we were in kind of a bit of a problem, let's say with our cash flow and everything. Yeah. Um, so the only resolve to fix this problem was what? Open another restaurant. So we actually opened a third location with the entire mindset that we were opening that location to offset the second location that wasn't doing so well. And then literally we had a nice little clause in that second location that we could walk away after 18 months. And after 18 months, we gave the landlord back his keys, said thank you very much for using the property, it's not for us. And then we went back to our two other locations. We'd actually gotten into a little bit of more financial problems than, than I want to admit, but we owed a little bit of money to uh, one of the government entities um, which is what for giving us a loan. Yeah, which is what happens a lot in the in any startup. Yeah, yeah. so we, we, we took the next two years. I had to go back in the store, work almost all the hours. We got ourselves out of that rut. We paid the government back its money completely in advance. We, we had 24 months to pay it. We completed our payment in 22 months. And we said, we'll never let this happen again. And we didn't. Uh, we learned our lesson and moved on. Um, and then in 86, we opened our third location that actually had a full liquor license. So that was a new uh, avenue that we hadn't explored, having a full bar. Yeah. In we'd the only Columbus area? No, this one is in Cincinnati. Cincinnati, what Yeah, we, we, 
<laughs> down at campus. We our first Obviously. idea was we were going to go around campuses. Okay. And it actually worked out pretty well for us because while we were a fledgling concept moving around, um, we were only doing a store here, there, and everywhere. And years later, I was talking to this guy named uh, Ron. Oh, forgive me for not remembering your last name, but Ron worked at this company called Tech. Tom, Tectronics out of, yeah. out of uh, Chicago that analyzes the restaurant yeah. industry. And he turned to me and said, you guys made me reevaluate our entire system of, of restaurant analysis. He goes, you guys flew under the radar for years without being recognized. It, our model was that if there was three restaurants in a town, we recognize you and started following you. But you never had three restaurants in a town. The most we ever had was two. <laughs> and I beat at the UC, camp the one on UC's campus until there. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> It is? Yeah, pretty sure it's, it's been changed, but no, maybe not the original. No, I, I think, I'm sure we've gone from the original. I can't well, yeah, imagine. Yeah, not the original, but there, I'm saying there is one on Oh, campus, yeah, so yeah, yeah, we did come back yeah. to another street there. Yeah, no, we are, the original one was on Short Vine Street. Oh, yeah. and Up our, by our Bogart's, corporate, probably. Exactly, right across from Bogart's, and our offices were right above it. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, our corporate offices were right there for, yeah. for a number of years. Well, that's wild. Yeah. I did not know that. No. Okay, break time. Restaurant owners. You're watching MPTV, so you're obviously interested in increasing your sales and profits. But what if I told you you could eliminate the hope and pray out of your marketing? You could spend money and actually see results. You know, most marketing starts with attention, like a billboard. The problem is that attention leads nowhere. That's why we created the ROI Engine Restaurant Program. We take attention and gain huge engagement, whether it's in-store or online. We help you build a database with deep customer information that's comprised of email, cell phone, and birthday. And then we drive them into the restaurant with trackable results. Yes, results you can actually see. If you're interested and want to have a conversation, check out restaurantmarketingthatworks.com. Worst case scenario, you get a lot of great ideas. Now back to the show. And so when, you, when it went to masses, what, what, what got you? Obviously, those first couple of years, we've all been, I've been it, I've got two or three companies, I've had those years where the first couple of years you just do stuff that makes not a ton of sense, but it's to, it's to fix the past error. Like well, you yeah, said, yeah, it's their yeah. location to pay the second. When you got to a point where you guys were stable, where did you get that? You saw that vision, because there's a lot of restaurateurs well, out there like, hey, I got a cool concept. Yeah, I'm glad you asked me, that's a perfect question, because actually that was kind of like the next big step we made. We got ourselves to about eight, 10 restaurants but we were only able to maybe open one restaurant a year. Yeah. And we went, we're not gonna really be able to grow the chain as quick and as broad as we'd like to with just paying for it ourselves, one store at a time. It's gonna be very slow growth. So we said we can take 100 grand and open up one more store this year, 1990, or we can take our 100 grand and we're gonna go into franchising. And so it was in 1990 we made the decision to become a franchisor and franchise the concept. Wow. And so we went to a company called Francorp out of, yeah. out of Chicago. Francorp. They worked with us to develop all the documents and everything, and then we started franchising. 1991 came by with, I think we might have sold one, but never got one off the ground. Then in 1992, um, one of the ones we had, maybe like the second one we sold, actually got off the ground. And then it was literally like exponential growth from there. Because in 92, we got two stores. I want to say we started with two stores. I think we got open that year. Well, let's just say one. But it went from one to two the next year, to four the next year, to eight the next year, to 16 the next year. I think that was like 96. And that's where all of a sudden it was getting pretty hairy because we had gone from, I mean, think about it. In two years, we had probably almost doubled the chain. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> you were doubling and doubling. Yeah, yeah. And so all of a sudden we, we kind of had to slow down a little bit and start retooling a little bit because of our growth and stuff. And that's where we started bringing in outside people because we felt as we grow this chain, we need more people from the industry. And we brought in some other people from outside the industry. And I actually had to relinquish my position as chief uh, operations officer. Jim relinquished his pres position as president. And we handed those over to outside people to make you know a long-term uh, plan for the company. Yeah. That, that it would always be there and if we left, then that, that stability would still would be there. Yeah. Well, that's wild because I think back, you know, Anchor Bar and Grill, who's here, yep. uh, was influenced the first wing place. I'm from Northern Kentucky, Cincinnati area. And I remember, you know, Barleycorns and their 80s. Oh, yeah. Barleycorns yeah. was the only place in Northern Kentucky that had wings. Like you would go in somewhere and they look like you, yeah, I want buffalo wings. Yep. Like, what? What's wrong with you? What is a buffalo wing? And then uh, Buffalo Wings and Rings opened up in yep. late 90s, yep. early yep. 2000s. I and then that. eventually closed and then opened back up. Uh, and you guys were there. I remember seeing yep. the brand. 
it's cool to see a ghost because a lot of people have a hard time seeing that vision that you can go from one to two to two to four and then hundreds. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's a huge step. <laughs> Restaurant owners, did you know Matt has free online marketing courses that teach you how to successfully market your restaurant? Email support at mattplapp.com to get access to the courses and a free social media content calendar. What, what's your advice to people that are looking for that? They're at that five to 10, they own their own concept, they, they wanna get to the next step. Is it find experts that have been there, done that or? My first advice would actually be ask themselves, are they ready to take that step and have other people come in and have other people start messing where they've had all control? Yeah. Are you willing to share that control? Because yeah. that's a huge step. Yeah. When you have to share control and you've been the boss, <laughs> that's a big challenge. That's, that's like higher level delegating because a lot of us, I know me for an operator, yeah. for my business, I went from zero to 40 employees the last you know, eight, nine years. And three or four years ago, I had a hard time delegating. Like oh, I knew how to do yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. But now I've gotten, I've gotten good at delegating and gotten people out of the business and gotten out of the way of doing it. But the other aspect of it is, like you're saying, that's a higher level right. delegating. Now it's not delegating, it's giving control up. Yeah, and stepping out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's really hard. And then uh, another thing is, uh, well, somebody asked me this, what's your number? And this is a real odd question. I was like, what are you talking about? And eventually, what is it that you'd like in life that you'd be satisfied with? You know, and some people need hundreds of millions. Some people might only want a couple million. Yeah. And so you need to know what your real goal is at this point, where you're gonna go. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So wrapping up, as you look at 2020, 2021, what's out there, uh, you know, it's, it's ironic that you talked about finding places with equipment already there. There's a lot of restaurant real estate in this country right now available. There's oh yeah. A, a lot of savvy operators are, are yep. you know, eating it up and, and turning it in. What would be your advice for somebody that's uh, sitting here in 2021, 2022, looking to start a restaurant? Uh, well, my advice is if you really wanted to do it, do it. Yep. You know, there's, Just never, do it. there's never a good time. There, there, you know, you, and this is what I guess frustrated, and this I learned from Jim, this is a real important part. Um, in the beginning, it was like, you can sit there and spend all the time getting all your ducks in a row and everything exactly fine and try to have it perfect. But how much time do you lose while you're trying to get everything perfect. in your mind perfect? And, and so Jim's philosophy was, we're gonna correct it on the way. <laughs> we're correct on the fly. Yeah. And then that's what we really did by, you know. And I think we were able to get ahead of everybody by getting out there and getting experience and finding those problems we didn't know about. And so it's just, again, are you a person who feels like you got to do everything perfect? Are you willing to make mistakes and correct them on the fly and, and keep moving forward? And I think our, our path with correcting as we went was better because we got out there ahead of all these competitors that yeah. are now out there. Well, awesome. Well, I appreciate your time. Oh, my. And it, as it says, Hall of Fame <laughs> in the wing world. You know, if I take anything in this conversation, it's something I believe in. You know, Imperfect action is better than perfect action. Exactly. Uh, get out there, take chances, make risks. It's got to pay off. If it doesn't pay off, you're back where you started. Exactly. So thank you, sir. Yeah. Appreciate Pleasure. it. Yeah, great conversation. That's it for this episode of MPTV. We'll see you next time.